Hello, welcome to today's video. I want to talk to you about why you can't lose weight and it's not about calories. This video, I'm making this video because I have heard time and time again, and I hear this especially for women, they go to their doctors and their doctors tell them, yeah, this is because you, you need to lose some weight. Yeah, you've got these back problems because you need to lose some weight. Yeah, you have no energy because you need to lose some weight. It's all because you need to lose some weight. Why don't you just stop being lazy? Why don't you just try harder? Why don't you just starve yourself more? Just lose weight and everything will fix itself. And it bothers me so much. It bothers me so much because it's it's so arrogant because nobody wants to be overweight. No one wants to hold extra fat on their body. And the doctors are supposed to be the people that tell you why your body's holding extra weight and to give you strategies to help it not hold that weight anymore. And they don't do that. They just shame you and blame you. And I want to equip you with tools. I want to help you figure out what you can do so you can lose that weight. How to lose weight, especially for women. And it's not about calories. So there's a couple of things you have to look at here. And this is not a one size fits all journey. I'm not going to say, oh, it's not calories. It's this thing instead. Just do this thing and everything will get, get fixed. That's not what I'm saying. There's some biomechanics that we need to talk about. There's some hormones. There's some processes that happen in your body that you need to understand so you can figure out changes that you can implement in your life to support this, these processes to, to address any dysfunction that may be occurring in your body. So first we have to look at your hormones. We're going to first look at specifically hunger and satiety hormones and insulin. Because so these this is the first step. The first thing that's worth knowing is it's basically impossible for your body to burn fat if you have high insulin levels. So if your insulin levels are high, your body will not burn body fat. It biochemically can't. It's very hard for it to access fat stores if the if insulin levels are high. So if you already know you have high insulin levels, if you've got high insulin, if you've got high um, hemoglobin A1C. If you've got uh, like a history of di diabetes, pre-diabetes, things like that in your family, this is something that you need to be looking at here. The solution isn't to just go and get insulin injections because your body's intelligent and it wants to self-regulate itself. We need to figure out why is it becoming less sensitive to insulin and how do we improve your insulin sensitivity? So anytime you eat anything, you will have an in you will release insulin. You will have an insulin spike. The the size of this spike is determined by the glycemic impact of the food that you eat. So if you were to eat, say, uh, a cookie or a pack of cookies or some kind of like refined carbohydrate, something very sweet, ice cream, you will have this, this massive spike in your blood sugars. And then as a response, because your body wants to keep your blood sugars within a certain range, your blood sugars will come up, your insulin will come up to match it. And as your insulin begins to rise, your blood sugars will begin to come down and then your insulin will come down as well. The thing is, this, this big spike, this is basically what stops your body from being able to burn fat. It's not that the spike is bad. It's if this is happening all of the time, your body never has the opportunity to burn its fat stores. It, it can't. It, biochemically, biologically, it can't. So if this is the mechanism that is preventing you from losing weight, we need to figure out how can we provide your body with an opportunity where insulin levels are low. And when insulin levels are low, your body will be able to tap into fat stores and it will be able to use your body fat as fuel. There's some other testing that you can look at that can be an indicator that your body isn't doing this very well. And this is your, this is your triglycerides. So what triglycerides are, are they're basically like little, they're like little molecules of fat. So your body can't just, you can't just eat fat and then your body just like pumps it around wherever it wants to go because your blood is, is based in water. It's like watery. And you've probably seen what happens if you put oil and water together. They, they don't mix. You've got the oil floating on the top and the water sitting on the bottom. So if you eat fat and your body tries to turn that fat into a fuel source, it can't just say, oh, let's burn fat. What it has to do is the liver has to break these fats down. And this includes body fat. It has to take this and it has to turn this into something it can use. It can turn this into ketone bodies. It can turn this into triglycerides. It can turn these into, these are basically like little baby fats, like little tiny, tiny baby fats that are dissolvable in your blood. That way they can get around, they can go to the cells, they can give you energy. If the insulin is high all of the time, and your blood sugars are high all of the time, your body never gets to use fat for fuel. So these triglycerides will begin to build up in your body and you'll begin to start seeing in your blood tests, high triglycerides, high triglycerides, high triglycerides. And this is even true for the, I believe they're called VLDL, very low density lipoproteins. These are things that your body wants to use for fuel, but it's never being given the opportunity. So the best thing that we can do is to provide the body with periods of time where insulin is low, 
blood sugar is low and then it can start to use triglycerides and ketones for fuel. There's a couple of ways you can do this. First is a ketogenic diet. So keto is really popular in weight loss communities for this very reason, because you just literally avoid everything that causes these big blood sugar spikes. So you have, you avoid all carbohydrates, all sweets, all um, anything that has sugar or carbohydrates and you just avoid it all. And you do still have blood sugar spikes, even when you eat protein, even when you eat fat, but you're gonna get a response that's like this compared to a response that's like this, <laughs> you know? So we're talking a completely different like order of magnitude of, of, a, of a response. And when you have a little baby response like this, it will calm down very quickly. Whereas what tends to happen when we have violent blood sugar imbalances, we we get this massive increase in blood sugar and then this massive increase in insulin and then your blood sugar crashes all the way down and then you get hangry and you're feeling oh blood sugar oh, and then you eat a cupcake or a cookie or you eat even something healthy you eat some fruit some some oats or something and then your blood sugar and then insulin's coming down and then your blood sugar bang all the way back up and then your insulin's like oh my god no one needs to go up and then you get this roller coaster all the way through the day and your blood sugars are all over the place and your emotions are all over the place and your body's like what is this craziness? This is extremely stressful. This does actually tax your adrenal glands. This is a significant stress for your body as well. These huge blood sugar dysregulations. And we're gonna to come to cortisol. We're gonna to come to the stress aspect of weight loss just in a bit. But this, doing this all day, very unhelpful for, for telling your body that you're safe and that it's okay to lose weight. Your body's like, oh no, this is scary. So ketogenic diet is one way we can do it because we just avoid these spikes it's like this and then you're like when it's really easy instead of all over the place. Some other ways we can do this would be things like intermittent fasting. So when you do intermittent fasting, you can eat whatever you want. You can eat carbs and everything. You've got the blood sugar spikes and everything, but then you get an extended period of time, say 14, 16, 18, 20 hours where you have no blood sugar spikes because you're not eating anything. So you have no insulin spikes and then everything begins to calm down. This is generally a better way for especially for women to do this because doing prolonged fasting is a little bit more stressful for your body and women I feel need to be more gentle and more considerate with their bodies they need to be more uh, attuned in their approach and some women they can do 36 hours they can do 48 hours they can do 72 hour fasts and it's fine because they've already built trust with their body because their bodies already feel safe if you're struggling to lose weight this is not you your body doesn't trust you, your body doesn't feel safe. So doing extended fasting, I would max out at probably 24 hours. I wouldn't consider doing anything more than that. But generally intermittent fasting is can be a better option. So this will help to get your insulin levels under control, your blood sugar levels under control, your body can start using ketones. And what's really important is even if you eat lots and lots of calories, and you can even eat in a calorie excess, because your body is now being given an opportunity, instead of burning sugars as, as glycogen and, and glucose, your body can actually use fat. It's gonna tap into your body fat stores. It's gonna tap your body fat and it's gonna start to use that as fuel. And as this happens, you'll see ketone levels rise, your triglycerides will come down because your body is metabolizing what's been stuck and hasn't been able to be, to be processed. So you'll see those come down and th this might be a bit bumpy at first. You know, you've probably had like keto flu. When your body's doing this transition, it's a little bit hard. It's kind of like trying to get an electric car to run on gasoline and petrol. It's like, oh, we're not used to this, you know, and your body has to adjust its metabolic processes and it's doing all of this rebalancing. So this is this is the first thing. It's your insulin and your blood sugar and making sure your body can, you can actually have an opportunity to use your fat stores. If your body doesn't ever get the opportunity, even if you eat in a calorie deficit, if your insulin is spiking, your blood sugars are spiking, your body never has the chance to use your body fat and it will just pile and pile up. I've had clients that that, se that severely under eat. You know, we're talking like 800 to 1,200 calories a day and they gain weight. And it's cr like, according to the laws of thermodynamics, it makes no sense. But then when you think about how what must be happening is their BMR is coming really, really low. The functions in their body aren't working. They don't methylate, they don't detox, their digestion sucks, they have no energy at all. They are freezing all the time. It's because their metabolism is completely destroyed. So calories in, calories out, doesn't work. Not simple as that. Body will try to do where it can. So that's the first step. Step number two, you need to look at your hunger and satiety hormones being your ghrelin and your leptin. So just did a little bit more research on this just before making this video now. So ghrelin is actually secreted by your stomach. So you, your stomach itself is actually an endocrine organ, which is crazy when you think about it. I think we all get this idea like our muscles are, like do muscle stuff and like our stomach is like acid and digestion. But actually, most of your organs have some kind of endocrine function. Your liver works as an endocrine organ. Your muscles work as an endocrine organ. Your body fat works as an endocrine organ. So it's really important that we understand that the proportions of these things in our bodies are gonna have a direct impact on the signaling of our body because 
hormones. So endocrine organs produce hormones and hormones impact how we feel. So if you've got any kind of digestive problem, this can affect your ghrelin. So if you've got gut dysbiosis, if you've got leaky gut, this can affect your ghrelin, especially if this is up in your stomach. So gastritis, GERD, things like that, that can be something that you need to think about. Even if your digestive system is pretty good, ghrelin is something that makes you feel hungry. So when your ghrelin levels begin to rise, it makes you start to feel like you want to eat something. What can happen is you can become ghrelin sensitive, which means a very small amount of ghrelin makes you feel very hungry very quickly. And the best thing that we can do to reduce your sensitivity is to try to create like a, the idea is ghrelin resistance, is to make it so that your body is more able to resist the effects of ghrelin. And often the way this works is, especially with these kinds of biochemical processes, it's about st stimulus, it's about how we stimulate these things. And this is one reason that the fasting model works really nicely here. If you're eating all the time, you're basically telling your body, you only need to do a little bit of a little bit of ghrelin and I'm gonna eat, I'm gonna snack, I'm gonna eat something. So then it's like boop, 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 boop. And even in this tiny little range, you, you feel like when you go from here to here, your body is like, oh, I need to eat something, I need something now. So you're like, okay, I'll have something. Whereas when we use intermittent fasting, when we or when we use prolonged fasting, we can we can modulate your ghrelin sensitivity, which basically means you could go from here to here, and what would normally make you feel extremely hungry, like ravenous, you you just feel that as almost like nothing. And your ghrelin levels actually have to get to a point about here before you even start to realize that you're hungry and that you need to eat something. So this way, we've basically reduced your sensitivity to your ghrelin secretions. One of the best ways to do this is to train it. So training it with intermittent fasting, training it with more prolonged fasting. Again, for women, wouldn't suggest over 24 hours, especially if you're working on this weight situation or if you've got any kind of blood sugar imbalances, any kind of adrenal fatigue, PCOS, any kind of hormonal imbalances, not recommending you go more than 24 hours. Intermittent fasting is probably a better option, but this can help you with resetting this. And then on the other hand, you can think about these two hormones of ghrelin and leptin, and they're almost always talked about together because they're, they're like this. They work together. They're, they're part of the same kind of axis. So ghrelin makes you feel like you need to eat something. Leptin makes you feel full. Leptin is what is, is, a, is a, again, like a hormone that is triggering your body to say, I've, I've had enough. I'm satiated. I don't need to eat anymore. So with with leptin, we actually want to become more sensitive, not less. We want to improve our sensitivity to leptin. We want to make it so that we can feel satiety sooner. We can feel satiety quicker. So we make it so that when we eat, we reach a point where we don't want to eat anymore and we can, and the body is saying, that's fine, I don't want anymore, that's okay. So if your blood sugars are going all over the place, if you're extremely stressed, if your cortisol is all dysregulated, and again, we're gonna to come to that in a minute, this is gonna really affect your your leptin. It's going to make it so that you don't feel so satiated so so quickly. And this is one reason that doing calorie restriction diets, especially in the long run, they do not work because you are basically trying to resist your biology. You're trying to use your willpower to overcome a biochemical process that's happening inside of your body. And that's like, if you ask me, like, that's just stupid. Why would you try to fight your body like that? It just doesn't make any sense. If you can understand the biomechanics and you can understand how these hormones work in your body, you can actually work with them and then you can use them to do all of the heavy lifting and you don't have to put anywhere near as much effort. So the best way that we can improve your, your, your leptin modulation, the way that we can make it so that you become more sensitive to this, so that you want to stop eating, so that you eat less overall is again utilize this fasting balance to, to balance your blood sugars ghrelin. but then we combine this with when you do eat you need to absolutely fill yourself up calorie restriction is the enemy here in your feeding window so you're doing intimate fasting in that window where you are eating you need to eat as much as your body will allow you to you need to reach that point where your leptin trigger is like you're going to hit that bliss point where your body's like <sighs> I'm full. Like, you know how it feels after you've eaten a, a, like a big meal and you're like, I don't want to eat a single bite. Like, I'm just satiated. I could not eat anything else if I, even if I wanted to. At that point, you've, you've triggered that, you've tipped that leptin switch. It's done. Your body is like, okay, I don't need any more. We want to trigger that on a daily basis as many times as we can. The trick is triggering that without 
overeating. So this is why you have to combine it in concert with your blood sugars, with your insulin, with your ghrelin. You know, if you're snacking and nibbling and eating something all the time, you're never triggering that, that leptin response. You nibble, 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 nibble. And, and your body is like, I'm not full, I'm not full, I'm not full. So when we're able to eat like a, like a big meal, like, and this is why snacking, like avoiding snacking is really important. We eat a big meal. We, we, it's, it's kind of like, imagine at the carnival, it's kind of like this big thing with a bell at the top and you like hit the thing at the bottom with a hammer and it goes all the way at the top and bang it hits the it, it, it goes ding it's like we want to do that with your with your leptin we want to make sure that we we bang really hard on the bottom of that thing the thing goes up hits the thing ding and you you get this signal in your brain your leptin your your body is like oh we have been nourished we are fully satiated and this triggers your leptin like we're good and now if you do this over and over and over again your, your, your level that you have to get your hit to reach your leptin satiety is gonna come down and down and down and down and down. And you'll reach a point where you actually get more, you get full, you hit that point without eating so much food. And this is your body beginning to rebalance itself. This is your, when you combine everything that we've talked about so far in the video, this is mastering your biology of your hunger and satiety hormones and your blood sugar balance. This is probably the biggest problem that most people have is they don't understand these biomechanics. If you can implement this strategically and there's other things you can do as well you know i'm only i'm only trying to explain the biomechanics of this process and give you a little bit of an idea you know there's a lot of other things that you can do like eating if you're going to eat carbs if you have some fiber before if you have a salad before you have your your pizza or your pasta that will reduce your blood sugar spike if you have some vinegar before the meal that will reduce your blood sugar spike if you do some exercise after you eat meal especially something that's more carby that will reduce your blood sugar spike so there are many other things that we can do but i'm just trying to give you an understanding of hunger and satiety hormones your insulin and your blood sugars and the biochemistry that connects all of these things together because if you can if you can understand this and if you can not just understand it like getting it as an idea isn't good enough you actually have to start to modify your lifestyle you have to change the way you eat not just what you're eating like not, not just changing your diet but changing your habits around eating changing the way that you go about approaching food and, and eating and nourishment for your body if you can if you can change these things you'll see significant improvements you will feel these blood sugar spikes that go like this they make you feel not very good they make you feel brain foggy they make you feel lethargic. They drain you. They're extremely taxing on your adrenal glands. When you're able to regulate your blood sugars, you will feel so much better. You'll feel so much more like a balanced person. And the weight just comes off by itself because your body is intelligent. It isn't this like stupid fat, like blob that wants to just keep gaining weight. It wants to be healthy. Your body is health. That is what it is. That's its truest expression. And if it isn't being health, then there's a reason. And hopefully in explaining this biochemistry to you, you now have a better idea of how and, and what you can do to change it. There's there's more to this, but this is, this is getting a bit long. I don't wanna make this too long. So I'm briefly just gonna bullet point you a couple more things. Right? If these are things that you're interested in hearing about, I can go into them in more in-depth videos like I have in this one today. So you also have to look at your stress hormones. Something that's really interesting is your cortisol is almost directly connected to your insulin. If you're stressed for some reason, your, your cortisol levels will rise, your insulin levels come up too. It's a really bizarre, very interesting thing that happens. But just as I've explained, when your insulin is high, you will not be able to access your fat stores. So if you're constantly stressed all of the time and your cortisol levels are always high, if you're in chronic stress, if you have a high stress job, if you are taking care of kids and you're not getting the support that you need, whatever it is, if your stress is up here, your insulin is also up here. So you can do the time-restricted feeding. You can try and work on the ghrelin and the leptin. It's not gonna make much difference because your cortisol levels are high and you need to address that. Like your cortisol levels are not supposed to be high all of the time. You want your body to be able to adapt responsibly to stress. So if you have an acute stress, bang, cortisol through the roof. This is how you respond. This is how you show up. But if this is high all of the time, that's not good. Something else to consider are the, the impacts of methylation. So I know Dr. Ben Lynch, he's a big methylation expert. He's a dirty genes, that's the one. Um, I was reading in his book, several of his clients, have held weight simply because they don't methylate correctly. If your methylation processes aren't working properly, your body biochemically is not able to function. And if your body doesn't work, it's just gonna adapt. It's just gonna survive. And also, if it isn't working properly, do you think that's gonna be stressful? And do you think that's gonna be raising your cortisol levels? Or do you think that's gonna be signaling safety and bringing them down? It's gonna be putting them up. So we need to look for 
where in your biochemistry, where in your biochemical process are your body not functioning correctly? Because all of these things create stress and stress causes weight gain. And again, it's not just about the stress of having the job and the stress of having the kids. You have nutritional deficiencies. If you're not methylating correctly, if you've got chronic toxic, toxin exposure, anything that's causing chronic stress, muscle imbalances can do this. If you have an injury that didn't heal properly, this creates chronic stress. This can make you hold extra weight. So we need to investigate all of these things and, and address them and, and work on them because if you actually want to get the outcome, I think anyone that's overweight says, oh yeah, I'd love to lose some weight. Do you really? Like, it's not just about like guilting yourself or like trying harder. You actually have to learn how your body works. You have to build a relationship with your body and you have to figure out how, how weight loss actually works. Not just like count the calories and completely destroy your metabolism and fuck up your stress hormones and destroy your body. And then you have to go through an even more difficult process of recovering, you know, because you develop PCOS and like insulin resistance and a whole bunch of different things. But do you really want to, to lose the weight? Because just cutting the calories out isn't gonna cut it. You actually have to understand how your body works and you have to implement strategies around how your body works and support it. The final thing that you need to consider is if your body is storing toxicity because it is unable to process it, your body will try to build fat stores to hold fat soluble toxins. So this is mycotoxins, this is plastics. You know, I know that you don't wanna hear this because I know that you like to wear that like sexy gym wear, you know, those like leggings that are really tight to your legs and like the sports bra and stuff. If these things are made out of plastic, if these are made of polyester, if these are made of nylon, they are putting estrogenic toxins into your body. Not only are these the base for estrogen based cancers, let that sink in, but they also need to be detoxed, they are toxins. And they, if your body cannot get rid of them, it will store them in body fat. And surprise, surprise, if you've got all of these exogenous estrogens coming in and your body needs to store fat, where is it gonna make fat? It's gonna make fat wherever you would build fat when you have high estrogen levels. So it's gonna go straight on your belly, straight on your bum, and it's gonna go up here around, and under on your, around your boobs. That's where it's gonna go because that's where estrogen signals it to go. So you have to think about these things. You know, you have to think about your, the different toxins that you're being exposed to, and you have to support your body's ability to eliminate these toxins. Again, one of them is methylation. So that's really, really important. There's, there's a million other avenues I could go, you know, if you're not digesting your food correctly, if you are constipated, everyone knows that if, you, if you're constipated, you're just like full of poo, right? And that's going to make you look overweight. It's going to make you feel really crap. Your gut health is really important. You can, I've seen these, this incredible study. They take a healthy, they take a healthy mouse and they take a mouse that is obese. They take the gut flora from the obese mouse and they put it in the healthy mouse. Same diet, same calorie intake, no other changes. Skinny mouse gets fat. Who would have guessed it, right? Microbiome, also extremely important. So you have to think about weight loss holistically. You have to think about your body weight as a symptom of health. And if your body weight isn't what you want it to be, you're probably not as healthy as maybe you might think. And we need to do a little bit of digging. And if we can address this at the stage where a little bit of low energy or like some small hormonal symptoms, like maybe a bit of acne, cystic acne or something, and not being able to lose weight. If we can address this before you develop insulin resistance, before you develop PCOS, before you develop some kind of like type two diabetes or endometriosis or an estrogen based cancer, you know, it's so much easier to fix these problems before they, before they spiral out of control and turn into the ugliest expressions of these things all the way at the end. You know, let's fix this problem before it turns into this big disaster. Hopefully, with everything I've given you today, you're a little bit more well-equipped to be able to do that. But if you do need my help, I'm quite happy for you to reach out. You can shoot me an email, support at williamdickinson.co.uk. I answer all my emails. I'm, I'm here for you. You can send me a message. You can contact me however is necessary. Just let me know that you need a little bit of help, and I'll do everything I can to, to help you out. If you have any questions, please do let me know. Leave them for me below, and I'll make sure that I get back to it every single one. I really hope you've enjoyed today's video. Take care and I'll see you in the next one.